Peterson. I'm a neuroradiologist here at Creighton University Medical Center. Um, we're going to discuss uh, subdural hematomas very briefly uh, in this short lecture. So before us, we have an axial image uh, from a non-contrast head CT, uh, and it's got some important findings on it. So let's dive right in and discuss those. So the first thing I want you to notice is that there is a hyperdense crescent-shaped extra-axial collection that extends along the convexity overlying the left frontal lobe and portions of the left parietal lobe. And it's outside the brain, inside the skull, uh, and it's basically delineated uh, on its inner aspect by these white arrowheads uh, and at its outer aspect uh, by the black arrows. And you can see that that uh, collection is resulting in some mass effect intracranially. So um, what are the signs of mass effect? Well, uh, sulcal effacement, right? So here on the right side, you can see all the normal sulci within the brain. Uh, in the left hemisphere, we don't have any of those. They're all effaced. We also have partial ventricular compression. You can see that the frontal horn and the atrium of the left lateral ventricle are smaller than their right-sided counterparts uh, related to the compression and the mass effect. And lastly, uh, we actually have frank midline shift. So you can see the reflection of the dura here called the falx, which runs in the anterior and posterior interhemispheric fissures. Um, and you can see that the septum pellucidum that's normally in the midline is actually shifted toward the right in this case. So we have right to left midline shift, also, one, also known as subfalcine herniation. So there's a differential diagnosis for extraaxial collections, um, and uh, this is just a general differential, not so much for this case, but um, so this crescent-shaped hyperdense collection, this is a subdural hematoma. There isn't a differential diagnosis for this case in particular, but you can have other subdural collections. You can have empyemas, which would be a collection uh, of pus um, in, a, in the clinical setting with infection. You can have a hygroma, uh, which is a... Uh, basically a subdural collection of CSF. Um, you can also have an effusion. Uh, and then you can have an epidural hematoma, which is in a different uh, space and has a different morphology. There's a separate short lecture on that particular entity. Uh, so we'll kind of take a deeper dive into that. So let's talk about subdural hematomas. Um, and in this setting, we're talking about acute subdural hematomas. So uh, the findings buzzwords are crescentic and hyperdense uh, extraaxial collection. Um, these tend to spread diffusely over the cerebral convexities, as you can see in this schematic and in our case here. Uh, they often extend along the falx and the tentorium, not just over the convexities. Uh, the cortical veins are displaced inwardly. Uh, by these collections. So this is a finding that we can see on MR. It's a little bit tougher to see on CT. Um, and uh, these collections routinely cross sutures, uh, but not dural attachments uh, for obvious reasons. So location-wise, um, this hemorrhage is between the uh, inner border of the dura and the arachnoid. Um, and hence, it's a subdural hematoma. So uh, they tend to occur at the supratentorial convexities. Um, they can be interhemispheric fissure, they can be in the interhemispheric fissure along the falx, um, and they can also uh, extend along the tentorium, which uh, separates the compartments between the cerebral hemispheres and the cerebellum. So causes, obviously trauma uh, is the most common cause. Uh, they can occur in impact and non-impact injuries. Um, and what, what happens is, is we actually get tearing of the bridging cortical veins as they cross the subdural space into the dural sinuses. And, and so it's a venous bleed. Um, these can also occur in non-traumatic settings. Uh, you can get dissection of an interparenchymal hematoma into the subarachnoid space and then into the subdural space. Uh, you can have uh, aneurysm rupture um, that can result in these. Now that's typically more what you see in the subarachnoid uh, hemorrhage, but they can uh, basically extend into the subdural space uh, from there. Uh, vascular mal malformations uh, in the brain and along the dura can result in subdural hematomas. Uh, in patients with moya moya, uh, which is kind of an exotic diagnosis um, where uh, you 
they have proximal uh, vessel occlusions and tons of tiny collaterals uh, congenitally. Um, they have a propensity for ischemia in, uh, in children and hemorrhage <clears throat> in adults. Um, and when they do hemorrhage, uh, it can be uh, either subdural or subarachnoid hemorrhage. And uh, they can also be spontaneous associated with coagulopathies. So clinically, um, these patients usually present with trauma um, and these can be uh, asymptomatic uh, or they can result in complete loss of consciousness. Uh, and that's usually related to the amount of mass effect that they're causing. So other symptoms um, that are usually related to mass effect uh, caused by these collections, you can get frontal neurological deficits and you can have seizures. Um, early symptomatic presentation and older age have a worse prognosis. That generally means the collection is larger and resulting in more mass effect. Um, management, uh, these are surgically evacuated uh, if they're large uh, and causing uh, mass effect, uh, or they can be observed uh, and they'll eventually go away by themselves if they're uh, small enough and not causing too many uh, massive intracranial mass effect issues. So, um, and uh, this basically depends on the amount of hemorrhage and the underlying brain volume, um, which is basically the equation that's going to give you the amount of mass effect in midline shift. So, uh, these tend to recur uh, commonly. And that's it for our short discussion of subdural hematomas.